So, you know, it's funny when I think about the first VH tapes, tapes I ever did, I actually did them in Australia before. So I, got, I came to America, met my wife, got married, went back to Australia for a year. And then I was going to come back to America full time, which I did. Well, in that year I went back to Australia, I uh, made my first three videotapes. Uh, there was a trailering tape. There was one called Suppling and Body Collection, I think. And there was another one called Maneuvers. They were the three first VHS tapes that I ever did. I went to a local news crew and where I lived in Rockhampton, Queensland, news station, and I said, how much to hire a camera and a cameraman? And I want to film some shit in the arena. And uh, they came out. I had a piece of po uh, paper in my pocket that um, had the topics I wanted to talk about. And I'd pull it out and I'd say, okay, I want to talk about this and this. And I'd stick it back in my pocket and I'd just start fucking yabbering and I'd do it. It's pretty, pretty embarrassing now. We'll show the videos. They're pretty embarrassing. If you've got these videotapes, keep these some bitches because they're good ammunition to embarrass me with. They were the three videotapes that I did. It's funny, a lot of the information on it I still actually do, but it's broken up a lot more. So when I first came to America, I had those three videotapes ready to sell. And back then, I think the videotapes used to sell for about 40 bucks a VHS tape. But I soon realized that the problem with those three videotapes was this. In the beginning, when I was doing clinics, uh, some of you will remember this if you're still following me, I would do a clinic. I'm talking about in the very beginning when I came to America to do this. So I'd have, say, 10 people in a clinic. So what would happen is you would all get two individual training sessions with me a day. Because of the 10 people that showed up, one lady is a great rider. Two guys are shitty riders. This lady's intermediate. This lady's good. Like the, the standard of riding and the horses are all over the place. So it was virtually impossible for me to do any group instruction. And not only that, I, I'm not getting that many people to show up, somewhere between five and 10 people a clinic. So what I did is I gave everybody a number, one through 10. So Betty, you're number one. So you get 20 minutes with me this morning. We can work with your horse on the ground. We can work with him on the saddle. I would say, Betty, what are your biggest issues that are pissing you off about this horse or the biggest issues you want to fix? And you'll say, Clinton, son of a bitch bites me. He won't stand still at the mounting block and he won't get in the trailer. And I'll say, great. We're going to fix all three things by the end of this weekend. So I'd work with you for 20 minutes. And when I say work with you, most of the time, I just fucking took the horse and fixed it myself because it was less frustrating for me to get a hold of it and, and tune its ass up than try to instruct it. So I'd just take the horse, fix it, make it better, give it back to her. She's happy, slap her on the ass, go sit down, okay? And then I'd get the next person out and it'd be that turn. And the, and, and the good thing about that way of doing it was you got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with me. Even though it was only 20, 30 minutes, it was pretty intense. Like you got, I gave you a lot of information in a quick amount of time and I got a lot of results done because I was doing the work myself. See, I'd get on the horse. If you said the horse was, wouldn't lope, I'd get on the son bitch, whip its ass, lope it around the arena. I'd do everything for you. Basically, I was your stunt double. So anything the fucking dangerous that had to be done, I did it, okay? Because I always remember, rule number one business, dead people don't write checks. So I had to keep my customers alive. So if I tried to get them to do some of the shit that needed to be done, you know, remember those two clinics were a lot of them in the beginning were just a Saturday and Sunday. So I got two days to fucking turn some shitty horses around and get them to be productive citizens in two days. I don't have a five day clinic or a 10 day clinic. I got two fucking days. Okay. So four sessions, basically. So then I do everybody once we'd have lunch. And then after lunch, I'd reverse the order and we would do it all again. Now, I wouldn't, you could either ride your, in your session with me, you could ride, you could work on groundwork. Hell, you could sit in a chair and smoke a cigar and make me do it all. I didn't care. As long as you were happy. So I just told you to tell me the biggest things you want to fix or what you want to get accomplished. So if I'd get an advanced rider and she said, Clinton, I want to learn to do flying lead changes. As long as the horse is ready to do it, I'd teach her flying lead changes. The next lady might say, Clinton, my horse won't stand still when I get on the mounting block. He keeps walking around. I want him to just stand still so I can get on. I would teach the horse that. So the good news is you kind of got exactly what you wanted. And by the end of the two days, I had these some bitches with their horses with their hands in the air like peace. Can't we all just get along? And they were fucking, you know, pr pretty productive citizens. So that worked well for a couple of years, but here was the problem. So back then I was selling probably a halter and lead rope, a stick and string, and the three VHS tapes. But I soon realized if I wanted to develop a horsemanship program that I could teach to the masses, the way I was doing it was not going to work because I was treating everybody as an individual. 
I wasn't treating everybody as a group. Well, I couldn't treat them as a group because the fucking, the level of ability in these people were all over the place. You know, it's hard to teach a subject to beginners and advanced and expert people that are all in the same boat. You have a beginner class, you have an intermediate class, you have an advanced class. That's easier because you've kind of got your children, you know, you don't teach grade 11 math to a grade one student. You've got to have grade one students together and grade 11 together, you know. So after a couple of years, I realized this. I could keep doing what I was doing, which was decent successful, but I was never going to grow it into a worldwide brand. I was never going to grow it into something outside of myself. It was never going to grow into, you know, what we call the method today. It was just called horsemanship back then. So I wanted it to grow into that. I wanted it to get bigger. But I knew to get bigger, I had to have a system in place, kind of like the military. The military in, in you know, the wars in 100 years ago could train 50,000 soldiers to ride a horse. So they had a set resume. Everybody get on the left side. Everybody hold the reins like this. Everybody do this. Like when you're trying to train massive amounts of people to get along with a horse, it's not that easy. So to do it, you need a very structured step one, step two, step three kind of logical thinking to get this done. Well, I was always naturally very good at logical thinking. Step one, do this. Step two, do it. That's how my brain kind of works, okay? I just scrapped those three VHS tapes and I came out with a series called Riding with Confidence Series 1, 2, and 3 and Gaining Respect and Control on the Ground, Series 1, 2, and 3. Pretty bad still, pretty embarrassing shit, but, but better than the first one, so I'm going the right direction. And that's how I made money. And from then, I started changing the clinics into, um, I think it was like Riding 1 clinic, you know, Riding 1 or Riding 2 or Riding 3, but most of the customers were just in Riding 1 or Groundwork 1. So then I... I did go through some struggle there. When I tried to change all the customers, here's what I learned about humans. We fucking hate change. As humans, we hate it. Even if it's good change, we still hate it. So when I changed from individual coaching at a clinic to I said, okay, everybody, now we're all going to be in one group. So everybody's going to do cruising at the walk or trot. Everybody's going to work on one rain stops. Everybody's going to do bending. When I tried to change everything to a group atmosphere, Oh, I got some pushback. People bitched about it. People whined about it. I lost a few people. But I also gained a lot of people too because I could get everybody busy all day. The negative to doing individual lessons was everybody sat around a lot all day, okay? Where, where in a clinic, when you treat everybody as a group, everybody's busy all day. So they're kind of happier. You're keeping them busy. You know, at the end of the day, they're fucking exhausted. So they're not asking you as many questions. It was good for everybody. Okay. So, so I got a, quite a bit of pushback on it initially, but then it kind of, they got over that pushback and they liked it. You know, it kind of reminds me, you know, when I went in the club, when we changed the club from the DVDs and we put everything on the streaming app. In, and the journal, you know, the journals, everything onto the app. And I got rid of the, D, the DVDs and all that kind of stuff. Oh, people bitched and whined and fucking threatened to leave the club and threw down on me. And I just didn't budge. I said, fuck it, people. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. And some people dropped out of the club. They were pissed about it, long-term members. But now, the long-term members that stayed, if you ask them, what do you like about the app now? I love it. It's on my phone. I love it. It's on my iPad. I love the, the arena mates on my phone. I love that I've got everything at my fingertips. Now, if you said, we're going to go back to the old way we would do it, they'd scream and holler again. No fucking way. So I don't, but you've got to realize you've got to listen to your customers to a point. But as a businessman, you've also got to do what you think is visionary for your business. And I've always been like that. Even if it ruffled feathers, I had to do what I thought in my gut was best for my business, okay? What you see now, Fundamental Enemy and Advanced, is probably the fourth generation, technically, of the method. Because I've scrapped it three other times and redid it all over the last, you know, 20 years, 25 years. Because every time I redid it, it got better. And now we can update it and upload it to the app without having to do a recall. It's just, it's like software updates on your phone. It just happens overnight, doesn't it? Well, that's what I get the ability now with the app is that I can update the method quickly without having to go through a bunch of printing. You know, remember all of those kits that I got, you know, those big, beautiful kits, fundamental, intermediate, advanced, all those kits, you know, I had to order a thousand of them at a time.
you know, I, I'm, I, at one point I had like six million dollars in fucking inventory for Christ's sake because I got to buy one to two thousand kits at any one time from China to get them in bulk enough because American prices were so outrageous. You had to go overseas to buy all those kits. So I had millions and millions of dollars in inventory in Texas just sitting there. So I suppose my answer is when I thought I could do something better, I refilmed it. Even if it costs me money, even if I lost money, I always wanted the latest and greatest car. I always wanted the latest and greatest information. And it served me well. Because a lot of people say, well, Clint, why don't you just sit back and rake in the money? You know, technically they're working, technically they're selling. Why are you going to spend three, four hundred thousand dollars and refilm everything? Because it can be better. That's just my mindset. If I can be better as a horseman, I got to produce better stuff. Now, obviously, there's some things that don't, if it's not fixed, if it's not broken, don't fix. We haven't changed our halter and lead rope in fucking 20 years because it's really good. It works. I've got the winning formula of rope, texture, etc. But, um, but as a general rule, I update the information anytime. And that's kind of one cool thing about the club is the club was a way for me to keep updating new information all the time as I got new information or experimented with it and I could share it with people more often. So... I always had an attitude, if I could produce something better, I was going to go ahead and do it. Even if it cost me money or I lost money, I couldn't go to bed at night knowing that I could do better.